Hi, my name is Chris Kavaller, and I'm here to talk to you about superheroes, or more generally, how in the United States we tend to put our heroes on pedestals, which means sometimes former heroes get knocked down. A little context, about a half mile from here, a statue of Stonewall Jackson, a former hero of the South, uh, was just removed last month. If you go another hour east, you'll hit Charlottesville, uh, where the night the right rally took place over the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee. If you go another hour east, you'll hit Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy, where statues of Confederate heroes have been coming down one after another all year. And right now I'm sitting in my favorite classroom at Washington and Lee University where I teach. And right now my board of trustees is in the process of deciding whether Robert E. Lee, uh, whether his name should be removed from the name of our school. Now, after I'm done talking, what you're gonna have to decide is whether superheroes should remain on their pedestal or if they should come down to it. But I wanna start by pointing out that I'm not anti-superheroes. I've always loved superheroes. I grew up on superheroes. I, I had a learning disability when I was a kid and I more or less literally learned to read from comics. I loved Marvel, X-Men, Avengers, Spider-Man. When I had kids, um, had a big, big old box of comics from um, my childhood. I tried to get my son to read pretty much every single one of them. My daughter used to have little tea parties with her superhero action figures. Superheroes are my children's childhood. They were my childhood. I passed that on to them. Um, around the same time as uh, my kids were growing up, uh, a group of honor students here at WNL were looking for a professor who could teach a course on superheroes. And they eventually found their way to me. I immediately said yes, because what could be more fun? a course on superheroes. So I started researching, I uh, prepared for the class, thinking I just had to fill in some um, historical background, get the context of when uh, the early superhero character types started. And um, that led to an article, which led to another academic article, which led to a book. And now I'm working on my fifth book on comics. I am, and I can say this accurately, a superhero scholar and a comics theorist. My kids think that's hilarious, but other people don't think it's very funny at all. Um, Bill Maher, uh, a couple of years ago when Stan Lee died, he had this to say. 20 years or so ago, something happened. Adults pretended comic books were actually sophisticated literature, and some dumb people got to be professors by writing about them. I'm one of those dumb people. And Maher goes on, he says, I don't think it's a huge stretch to suggest that Donald Trump could only get elected in a country that thinks comic books are important. Now, I really don't want to talk about Donald Trump, but I disagree with Bill Maher. I think he's got it exactly backwards. I think someone like Donald Trump could only get elected if we don't think comic books are important. Let me explain why. But let me first acknowledge an obvious point. Macho men in tights, they look ridiculous. Yes, comics are silly, superheroes are silly, but they do provide us a unique window into our culture. And it's through that window that I think we can learn some things about ourselves as a nation. Now, superheroes initially became very, very popular in comic form during World War II. And that's a moment when our country is at its most united, fighting against fascist forces for democracy. And the superhero answered that context. Think about Captain America, think about Wonder Woman, and literally their costumes are the American flag. And so that idea of superheroes as America continued after World War II into the Cold War and well beyond, the idea that superheroes are our champions of good. And that's part of the problem because what we consider good keeps changing. So the superhero has changed with that as well. So 1938, the first comic book superhero is Superman, but you go back a decade earlier and the character type is already there. You've got uh, the shadow on the radio. Go back another decade, you have Zorro in silent movies. Go back two more decades, you have Scarlet Pimpernel on stage and in best-selling books. If you think of research as archeology, span that's the surface level. What gets a little more disturbing is when you go a level underneath that. 
Think about the standard superhero costume. You've got a mask, you've got a cape, you've got gloves, you've got a identifying emblem on the chest. That describes Batman, that describes Spider-Man, Captain America, Green Lantern, Black Panther, the list goes on and on. Now, look at the costume worn by the KKK. You've got the cape, you have the emblem, the mask, the secret identity. The point of the costume is to disguise the wearer because in their minds, they're fulfilling a heroic mission. They're working outside the law in order to do what they consider disturbingly good. They, now that is vigilantism and the superhero character type romanticizes vigilantism. Now, when I first noticed that connection between the KKK and superheroes, at first I thought it was just, it's coincidence. Um, Giraffes and sauropods both have long necks. Uh, rhinoceroses and triceratops both have horns. So what? There's no evolutionary connection between them because they're divided by millions of years. But that's not the case with superheroes in the KKK. Usually when we think about the Klan, we think about the period right after the uh, Civil War. Uh, but the Klan reformed in 1915. Civil War had been over for almost a half century. Uh, what happened is that a film came out, The Birth of a Nation. It was based on a much earlier novel called The Klansman, uh, technically historical novel. It's, it, it, from its viewpoint, it, the South was saved by the creation of the Klan uh, in order to prevent what it called Negro rule. It is a vile, vile novel. The film is just as bad, but even more popular. Uh, it was a national hit. It wasn't just focused just on the South anymore. Um, and this became common belief about the Civil War. Uh, when President Wilson watched the film in the White House, he said, my only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Fans came to the premiere in Atlanta dressed in clan robes, what we would now consider cosplayers. But unlike contemporary cosplayers afterwards, they went to Stone Mountain Confederate Monument outside Atlanta. They lit a cross on fire and they declared the clan reborn. Five years later, nationally, the clan had a membership of roughly 5 million people. At one point in the 1920s, 50,000 Klansmen marched on D.C. They were praised in newspapers from sermons. They were considered a force of good, that their vigilantism is what we needed to fight criminal immigrants. Now, at the moment when the Klan gets most popular, about 1920, that's the same year that the film The Mark of Zorro is released. Zorro, the mass, the cape. His emblem's not on his chest, but he has the same Z, as a Z signature. He is the prototypical superhero. Now, unlike triceratops and rhinos, there's not millions of years dividing these. The clan and the proto-character of Zorro achieve top popularity at exactly the same moment in the same culture. That's not coincidence. You don't get Zorro without the clan and you don't get all of the superheroes who followed either. Now, the Klan wasn't just the Klan. The Klan was just one part of American culture at that point. There's even a larger, more disturbing context. And the, that history is encoded in one of the most famous superheroes of all, Superman, his name. When I started researching for that class, I typed in Superman into a um, newspaper database search engine with the cutoff date of, um, uh, April 1938, the year he appears in comics. And I assume there would be nothing before that date because how could there be? There were over 2,000 hits. Now, at first, I, it made no sense to me. And then I realized, oh, there's a play called Man and Superman that premiered in 1903. That's when the word Superman came into the English language as a translation of Nietzsche's Ubermensch. So I thought, oh, okay, puzzle solved. Except all the references weren't in theater. They were in Arts and, lit arts and literature, they were in the sports section, they were in book reviews. I saw a ballet dancer referred to as Superman of the Toe. Babe Ruth was called a baseball Superman. The boxer Jack Dempsey was called a Superman. Ben Franklin was called a Superman. Franklin Roosevelt, the living 
uh, politician was called a Superman. None of this has to do with comic books or about Nietzsche or about that play. This has to do with eugenics, which is a term that was coined in the 1880s, and it means well-born. The person who coined it was looking at the alumni list for Cambridge and Oxford. He was trying to understand this strange phenomena where why do people from the same families keep going to these top schools? And his answer was they must be genetically superior. And that included himself and it included his cousin, Charles Darwin, who had only two decades earlier published on the origin of species. Now that book at the time didn't invent the idea of evolution, it really codified it and turned it into a paradigm scientifically accepted. What was revolutionary about it was the idea that human beings didn't come into prominence because God decided it. It was just happenstance. Evolution happened to work out that way, which meant that it could work out differently. Humans could devolve or some other species could evolve and become more powerful from that. What happened as a result is the creation of eugenics, what is now clearly a pseudoscience, but the idea was that the human race could breed a new race of literally supermen. You look at the New York Times science section and you see article after article after article about the coming of the future race of the superman. And this is the same superman that the comic book superman is based on. The, the original comic script from 1934 Superman doesn't come from Krypton, he comes from Earth's future. He doesn't arrive in a rocket ship, he arrives through a time travel machine. Literally, Superman, the comic book character, is the Superman that was science was imagining was going to evolve from the human race. Superman is the Superman. Now, usually, when we think of eugenics, in the term that Superman, we think of Hitler. We think of Nazi Germany, we think of Auschwitz, we think of mass exterminations. And that's a more comfortable way of telling the story, but unfortunately it's not accurate. Eugenics came out of initially England, but more prominently the United States. The idea of the gas chamber is from 1912 Long Island. A American eugenics think tank put out ideas for how to fix the gene pool. They wanted immigration restrictions. They wanted racial segregation. They wanted anti-racial marriage laws, sterilization, and what they termed euthanasia. They wanted, unlike Hitler, they wanted gas chambers in every town in the United States in order to euthanize the locally unfit. This is all before the discovery of DNA. They had no idea what could be a hereditary trait, so they thought they could end feeble-mindedness, promiscuity, criminality, epilepsy, blindness, deafness, insanity, and poverty, all by breeding. And not coincidentally, they thought all of those traits tended to be from non-Anglo-Saxons. This is white supremacy. The IQ test was created in order to identify people not smart enough to reproduce. Planned Parenthood was created with the idea of using birth control to prevent unfit people from reproducing. Indiana was the first state to have a sterilization law in 30 states followed. What did the Supreme Court say in the 1920s? It is better for all the world if society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. When President Coolidge signed an anti-immigration bill in the same decade, he wrote, America must be kept American. Biological laws show that Nordics deteriorate when mixed with other races. When Hitler wrote Mein Kampf in the 1920s, he looked to the United States and he said to Germany, we have to do better. We have to, we have to follow the United States. We have to catch up with them on eugenics. When the bestseller, The Passing of the Great Race was published in the United States, Teddy Roosevelt praised it and yeah, because it specifically said that worthless race types should be sterilized. Hitler called that American book his Bible. This is the cultural context that the superhero emerged from. Without eugenics, there's no Superman. Without the Klan, there's no Batman. And the thousands and thousands of other superheroes that have followed since. Now, I want to be clear. 
the creators of Superman, the creators of the early comic book characters, the whole comic book industry, they weren't white supremacists. They were predominantly Jewish, but they were taking a pre-existing character type and adapting it to a new context of World War II. And in, in its DNA, that character type embodied white supremacy. Now, like Confederate statues, superheroes emerged in an explicitly racist moment. We need to acknowledge that so it's possible for superheroes to grow beyond it. And I believe that if we can face up to something as unimportant as comic books, then we as a nation have a real chance of facing up to the far more destructive legacies of our past. Thank you.